uh, a little bit annoying. I'm sorry about that, everybody. Anyhow, so the last live broadcast that started just a couple of minutes ago, YouTube decided to glitch out on us and uh, kill my webcam. So anyhow, here we are starting over again. This is going to be a really fun one. This is going to be uh, a lot about the basics. But remember, the reason that I'm doing this live broadcast is because I have this challenge going on this month. And I vowed to make sure that I hop on here every Monday and do a live broadcast, whether it's going to be uh, basic information, whether it's going to be in-depth. The purpose of this is to be highly interactive with everybody. So I've got the chat stream coming up right up above me in another screen. This way I can chat with you guys and we can rock and roll. So I want people to bring their questions. I want people to bring their fasting questions, their keto questions, uh, where they're struggling. This is a coaching broadcast. This is your time. This is some of the value that I bring to my channel and what I want to be doing for everybody. So I apologize about YouTube's glitch on that last one. But the good news is I think we hyped it up a little bit by having that little glitch. So we're going to jump right in. But first, I know some of you don't like it when I do this, but I'm doing it anyway. Comment where you're watching from. Say hello. Tell me what you're grateful for. Tell me what you're positive for because the world knows that we need it right now. Um, okay, we've got Australia in the house. Very cool. We've got Belize in the house. So if I'm looking up, I've got the chat stream coming up on another monitor. Um, this is awesome. Okay, we've got Houston in the house. We've got Canada. We've got London. We've got New Jersey. We've got Walnut Creek. You're not far from me. We've got uh, Toronto. All right, that's what I love to see. Okay, so lots of people here. Uh, quick reminder, down below in the description is the link to the video that outlines the meal plan for this whole challenge. So FYI, if that's what you're here for, um, that link is down below. It says video with original meal plan down below. And then before I jump into everything, I will go ahead and just make one announcement that some of you will hate, some of you won't care. Um, Thrive Market's having a huge, huge keto sale this week. So none of this stuff would be possible without them. So there's a link down below in the description. There's like 25% off over 250 different keto items right now because it's keto week. So do check them out down below in the description after this broadcast. Big thank you to Thrive and big thank you to everybody. <clears throat> All right. You know what? I'm going to lead off with this first question that comes in. Christopher Pruitt says, American miracle noodles. Can I have those on keto? Yes, you can have miracle noodles on keto. Uh, glucomine and fiber. So you will notice that sometimes it doesn't digest when it goes through you, if you know what I mean. So yes, it's totally keto friendly. It's good to go. Is it safe for someone with hypothyroidism to do OMAD or TUMAD? Um, Honestly, it's a tough one to answer because you have to do what works for you. I would usually recommend shorter fasts, not necessarily OMAD if you struggle with uh, hypothyroidism. Um, wow. Okay. So any questions? Okay. Any modifications to the plan for 76-year-old woman? So just so you know, this plan that she's referring to is a plan that is posted down below as a free, free meal plan that went with this whole challenge. Uh, if you are older, believe it or not, I mentioned this last week in the live broadcast, you actually want to do what you can to increase protein, okay? There are multiple studies that show that older populations do much better on higher protein diets as far as uh, maintaining muscle. Now, muscle is a secretary organ. It is not just what gives us strength. It has signaling properties that communicate with the organs and communicates with the brain. And that's why there's such a correlation with disease and wasting and, and muscle loss, right? So that's going to be the biggest thing that I would say is you might want to increase the protein by about 10% by everything else in the plan. Otherwise, you're generally okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to bring this, bear with me one second. This chat is too high up here and it's kind of bothering me. So I'm going to bring it over here. There we go. Okay. Can I have Splenda when I'm on keto? Tremendous question. You can indeed have Splenda. Do I recommend it? Not necessarily. The reason that I say this is because Splenda on keto still has an effect on the gut biome. One of the most advantageous things that we get out of keto is the fact that we get a shift in our gut microbiome. We have two specific bacteria, the names escape me right now because they're very long-winded names, that have a very positive impact. Uh, so two bacteria come into the body that normally aren't there as much. What happens is when we have Splenda, there are studies that show that it ends up killing off about 50% of our gut bacteria, not just over time, but in the pretty acute settings. So I recommend going with something different. I recommend going with stevia. I recommend going with monk fruit. Um, believe it or not, even aspartame, which I'm not a big fan of in general, uh, might be better than Splenda in that particular case. Um, so uh, with all your product videos where we review stuff in them, how do you feel about isopure drinks and powders and animal pack vitamins? Animal pack vitamins, animal pack's a good brand. I'm cool with their vitamins. Uh, isopure used to be really clean. They've made some changes. Isopure, uh, it's good that we just address this in general. When you're shopping for protein powders, 
when you're looking at whey protein, you want to make sure that you're getting one that is whey protein isolate, not whey protein concentrate. Whey protein isolate means that the protein has been concentrated out of the whey and you're left with just the protein without the milk solids and without the other stuff. So it's very, very important that you pay attention to that. Um, you're asking specifically about isopure. Isopure is a relatively clean quality. It's not grass fed, which doesn't matter as much when you get into the consolidated isolated protein, um, but still a good brand overall. Uh, stevia during a fasting period. Stevia is okay during a fast. However, one thing to note with stevia during a fast is if you get it in the powder form, it is going to be blended with maltodextrin, which will spike your insulin. So with any sweeteners that you're using during a fast, highly, highly recommend that you go with, um, go with a liquid version. And just for those of you that are just joining in this, a lot of it's going to be rapid fire. So you need to ask your question. If you really, really want your question to be seen, if you have to, you know, input it a couple times for me to see it, that works. Um, I'm not trying to make this, uh, a requirement, but people do the super chat thing. It does make the question stand out a lot more. Don't have to do that. Um, so Terry says, is the bone broth you can buy from Walmart a good one to break a fast? You know, I, I don't know specifically which one you're doing, but the most bone broth, if it's marketed as bone broth, it's got at least some bone broth in it. Make sure it doesn't have a bunch of natural flavors. That's one of the things. If bone broth should only have a few ingredients. It should have bone broth, it should have like apple cider vinegar, perhaps. It might have a little bit of salt. It might have, you know, it's going to have just the basic stuff. If it looks, if there's anything weird in there, eh, probably avoid it. But yes, it, it, I don't recommend bone broth to literally break your fast. I recommend it as sort of a pregame. So, you should be consuming a little bit of bone broth and then a little bit later have your, um, have your actual meal. Okay. Another question. Um, <clears throat> wow, man. Uh, Asian assassin says, thanks, Thomas been following you since 600 K about to get on this keto for life. Heck yeah. That's awesome to see that gallbladder and keto tips, this is some rapid fire covering a lot of ground. Okay. So the gallbladder remember is just a storage mechanism for the bile. Your liver is still producing bile. Okay, so what ends up happening without a gallbladder on keto is the liver still produces bile to help break down and, and assimilate the fats, but you don't have the gallbladder, you don't have the storage mechanism. So what happens is usually when you have a bolus of fat coming in, the gallbladder releases uh, a bunch of the bile and it allows the fat to break down. Without that, you have to wait this ramp up period for the liver to actually produce uh, produce bile. So what you may want to consider doing is in the early stages of the day, go a little bit lower fat and then increase the fats as you go throughout the day, which is actually quite the opposite compared to how I would recommend for a lot of other people. So just keep that in mind. You got to incubate yourself. Okay. You're never going to have any level of adaptation that's going to occur at a grander scale. You're always going to have to have a warm up period because you have to let your liver have a chance to warm up and get used to producing that much bile. Guys, can we make sure we hit that thumbs up button, please? That does help us out a lot. Um, ah, so many good questions coming in. Okay. Let's see. Hello. I want to gain weight with keto. Um, how do I do that? Uh, gaining weight with keto is actually quite easy. It's just making sure you get the right fatty acid profile. So I'll touch on this for a minute. Uh, what I mean by that is you don't want to be loading up on a bunch of omega sixes. It's very easy to just eat fat calories, but it's not so easy to get the right kind of fat calories. So, you know, what I mean by that is you want to have, um, you know, macadamia nuts, good quality fat profiles. You want to have, uh, fattier cuts of fish in this case, because you're going to get high degrees of omega-3s. Uh, you're also going to want to try to consolidate your protein as much as you can surrounding your workout period afterwards. Uh, really gaining weight on keto is not too, too terribly hard, even for hard gainers. If you type in uh, keto hard gainers, and then my last name, Delauer, I did a really good video that breaks that all down. Um, do I advise against sugar-free gum in the fasting phase and still encourage cellular autophagy? Uh, that's a great question, Dana. So I usually do recommend not having gum during a fast. Um, and the reason is, is because it's stimulating gastric juices, it's stimulating that, but it's also giving you artificial sweeteners, which I really just, if you can do without it, do without it. But I also know that some of those natural flavors are coming in. That's the bigger problem. Okay, I'd rather, if you want to have a little bit of iced tea, you want to put a you know a couple drops of stevia in it, I don't see a problem with that. But gum, you're usually loading yourself with chemicals, natural flavors, you know, trace amounts of, of gum that's getting in. Probably not the best thing. Plus, you're stimulating a lot of saliva, which is kind of confusing the digestive system. So I would recommend just probably abstaining from it. But again, now and then is not going to kill you. Um, a bunch of good questions coming in. Suggested protein sources for vegetarian keto. Tremendous question. Uh, one of the ones that I would recommend, of course, obviously going to be eggs. Of course, leaning more towards the yolk than just the white. Another thing that I would recommend is 
Believe it or not, as a plant source, flax is probably one of the better ones. I also recommend hemp, you know, using hemp as a good protein. So like hemp, which is like tempeh, but made with hemp because I don't like loading up with a bunch of fermented soy. So that's a tremendous vegetarian source of protein. Um, if you can manage to go pescatarian, I feel like pescatarian keto would be phenomenal because you get such amazing benefits there. But try making flax bread. It's like two ingredients, you know, or if you could make a really good bread with flax and egg if you wanted to go that route. Uh, Eva May says, thoughts on convenience foods that are marketed as keto friendly. For example, Aldi now has a zero net carb sandwich bread, uh, lupini beans, hummus, Quest chips, and frozen pizzas. Tremendous question. Okay, Eva, so what we have to remember with keto, with what's happening, keto is now, uh, there was a recent market poll that was done that shows that it, looking at search indexing, just so you know, it, keto is the most heavily searched diet in the world, of course. And it is second only to all the other diets combined. So it has more, so lots of people are searching for it and marketers know that, food companies know that. So what they do is they make hyper palatable foods with bright colors that are going to appeal to the ketogenic community. And they're just sitting on the grocery store shelves nonchalantly waiting for us to grab them. Does that mean that they're good? Um, it depends. Some convenience foods are actually not that bad. You know, for example, um, chomp sticks, which this isn't a plug. This is just an honest mention. It, like, you know, good quality beef sticks. There's no real preservatives in them. There's nothing wrong with that as a convenience food. Uh, but then you get down the line of these like, you know, fluorescent weird chips. You know, Quest has made a lot of weird products in their day. I know they have a few good ones. They have a few that are very, very frank and foody. You know, it's like we're trying to get away from this hyper palatability, this, this crazy sensation we get that makes us want to eat more. So I understand the method there. Um, most of the breads, you have to be really, really careful because a lot of them are just made with pure wheat gluten and they're just made with garbage. So look at the ingredients and make sure there's not a bunch of wheat gluten in it and make sure that there's not a bunch of soy oil. A lot of them have hydrogenated soy oil. I know, for example, I did a video specifically on the Costco keto bread because I was just alarmed at what was in it. Hydrogenated, which is pure trans fat, soy oil, which is like the worst possible fat. If there's one thing that I could say avoid on the ketogenic diet, it would be soy. Like do everything you can to avoid the soy oil on a ketogenic diet because that is not what you want running your body, let alone a hydrogenated form. Um, so there's a few companies out there that make some really good ones. Um, again, I guess it's I guess it's an honest mention that if you do want good keto convenience foods, um, the thing I do like about Thrive, and yes, Thrive does pay me for sponsorships on my channel, but this is an honest mention, is they vet out the keto products. So they're not full of preservatives, not full of garbage. So if you go to Thrive Market and you look at their actual keto selection and their keto tab, and you navigate to their, and you select search by, by diet and select keto, it's pretty darn cool because then they've got a bunch of keto convenience foods that don't have that stuff because that's their whole mission. So, I mean, it's worth mentioning there. Uh, opinion on dates. That's a good idea. The, the dates, the fruit. Dates are actually a decent fructose glucose profile. I just don't like eating a bunch of them. Now, I talked about them in my Ramadan live broadcast because one of the things that I've noticed, um, you know, with Ramadan is people break their fast with dates. I don't recommend breaking your fast with a lot of dates. I recommend maybe one date because I know sometimes it's customary. Um, but you're probably referencing like sugar, uh, sweeteners and where people use dates for sweeteners and stuff like that. I think a small amount is going to be fine. But remember, it's definitely not going to be ketogenic. You got to test your ketones and see how you land there. Okay, Tommy Grimm says, um, when I eat, it makes me need to use the bathroom immediately. Uh, any tips to prevent this from happening? Even happens when I, so if this is happening after fasting, this isn't that unusual. One of the things that you may want to consider doing, again, I'm not a doctor. Like I always say, I'm just some guy on the internet, but you may want to consider having a little bit of apple cider vinegar along with a meal just to kind of aid in the digestion. Um, so you might want to just try something like that. Um, if it happens on a ketogenic diet, it could be that you have a gallbladder issue and you don't know it. I'm not a doctor, so you may want to check that out because that is one of the things when people just get consistent diarrhea on keto. Uh, it's, not again, not uncommon after fasting for that to happen because all of a sudden your intestinal tract is empty and all of a sudden you're throwing a bunch of food at it. It kind of goes into a little shock state. Um, 
So good. Another question comes in from Austin Smith. Uh, thoughts on diaspartic acid? I know aminos can kick you out of keto, but not sure about DAA in particular. Austin, super good question. Um, I don't really see a specific benefit to taking diaspartic acid, which is generally used to help uh, increase testosterone levels. There's no real reason to take it. Oh, sorry, you're asking keto. No real reason to take it during a fasting state. Keto, it's certainly not going to kick you out of ketosis. Um, branch chain amino acids, on the other hand, can affect ketogenesis. Diaspartic acid, you're going to be limited effect on your ketogenic diet, so you're totally fine there. Um, how, how do I get a girlfriend on keto? Kent, that was a pretty good one. Um, keto's going to automatically get you a girlfriend. That's how it works. Let's see. Um, what can you suggest for a person that is allergic to fish or shellfish? Um, I don't know if you're looking for the specific macronutrient profile. Are, I don't know if you can handle um, algal oil, but algal oil is like an omega-3 that's going to be made from algae. So what I would recommend, what my concern would be, is that you're not getting a lot of omega-3s. Okay, so people that are vegan, for example, uh, not even vegetarian, but straight up vegan, it's very hard for them to get good omega-3s. Okay? Now, a lot of vegans will say that they get just enough omega-3s and it's fine, but the problem is they're getting it in alpha linolenic acid. Now that ALA does not convert into a usable form very well in the body. So it's very difficult. There are some ways around it, but one of the things that I typically recommend if you're someone that can't get natural omega-3s in is use an algal oil, A-L-G-A-L. -A -L. It's oil that would be derived from algae. So you still get the omega-3s. Uh, Wiggle says, do you have an Amazon affiliate link we can use to support you? Thanks to the honest review. Um, oh, the honest review of fitness equipment. You know, I actually don't even use the Amazon affiliate. Most of the time I don't do affiliate stuff. Um, you know, if a brand sponsors a video, uh, they'll help pay for the production of a video. That's kind of how the economics of my channel works. Uh, I don't do a lot of commission stuff. Um, just cause I, I just, I don't know. I just don't typically believe in that. I just, if someone wants to pay to help produce a video to get content out, great, but yeah, so I don't, but thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, Ali says, I did my sleeve surgery. Can you help me? They told me carbs less than 40, high protein. Can you tell me what I should do? Well, what, it's usually a food volume thing. So the way it looks, if you get like a gastric sleeve surgery, remember their, their biggest concern is making sure that you are successful with it and making sure that you're safe. So it's, they want you to have a specific volume of food. Um, I can tell you from my own experience, I'm not your doctor, so I have to say this with a grain of salt, that I have seen many people, many people go through gastric surgery or sleeve with the ketogenic diet and have immense success because the caloric density of food that you consume is much smaller. So you can actually get adequate nutrition with a smaller amount of food. So it works very, very well for a lot of people. Um, so the specific macros they're telling you aren't necessarily uh, you know, for your nutrition as they are more so just to keep you at a certain food volume. Okay. Does Prozac break a fast? Uh, no, it does not. Um, Maria says, I've been trying to get into ketosis for three weeks, tracking macros and 70% of my calories are coming from fat, 20% from carbs. I'm also fasting. Not, well, uh, Maria, I'll tell you right there, 20% carbs, you're too high there. What I would recommend you do is go down to 60% fat, 30% protein and 10% or less carbs and carbs that are coming from veggies only. You may even want to go down to 5% carbs to get yourself in there. You're actually going to be sitting in this gray area that's actually going to make you feel more miserable than if you were just on carbs or in keto altogether. Because right now, let me describe this in a really cool way. Everyone's going to benefit from this. Okay, this isn't just uh, for beginners. This is actually a great way to learn about it. Okay, so our mitochondria that creates energy in our cells does really, really well on whatever we give it more of and condition it to. So most of our lives, most of us have been conditioning our cells to create acetylcoenzyme A, uh, the ultimate root of energy, um, from carbs. So what happens is this, you go 20, 30, 40 years of consuming carbohydrates and being told that fats are bad for a long time, you don't consume a bunch of carbs. So, I mean, you don't consume a bunch of fats. So your body is so used to using those carbs. So then all of a sudden you cut your carbohydrates out and you start bringing in fats. What happens is you have all these enzymes and you have all this sort of horsepower that's designed to break down those carbs and utilize those carbs as energy, but you don't necessarily have the enzymatic function or the portfolio, so to speak, to break down all the fats yet. That's part of the fat adaptation phase is developing the machinery to break down fats. So if you don't actually give yourself enough fats and actually deprive yourself of enough carbohydrates, your body is still trying, it's still holding on. Um, I'm gonna use a terrible example here, but it makes sense. I mean, terrible as far as a lifestyle concern is, right? 
Okay, if someone is trying to change jobs, okay, let's just, they hate their job, they wanna go, they wanna jump ship, they're trying to like keep it kind of quiet, they don't want people to know they're leaving, but then all of a sudden, you know, they start their new job. But instead of just quitting their old job and starting a new job altogether and ripping off the Band-Aid, they stay at their, job, their other job part-time, 20% of the time. Okay, tell me that you are going to have success in your new job. So basically what I'm saying is if you leave your job and you go to a different job, then you should probably just leave your job altogether, go to that new job and focus 100% on that new job because that's going to give you the ability to at least succeed in that new job, rip off the Band-Aid, be done. But if you still continue to work part-time at that other job, now there's some, we don't need to get into the you know, details of that. Point is, if you're only giving 70 or 80% effort to that new job, you're probably not gonna impress your new employer. So the point is, when you're going into keto, you need to jump all the way in in the beginning because that's the only way you're gonna develop the machinery to actually utilize those fats better. <laughs> Someone says, flex your biceps with all due respect. I'm always flexing my biceps, even when I'm just hanging out. Um, I know there's a couple other questions that popped in on Super Chat. I want to make sure I address those. Nancy Dickens says, says I've just finished a 48-hour fast, and I had two salmon steaks. What else can I have? A protein shake, okay? So two salmon steaks, you're already looking pretty good on that. I would say um, you could have a protein shake right now if you really wanted to. That would be a lot of protein all at once. You're probably better off to wait about 90 minutes and then have just a larger meal that has some more fat profiles. Try to get the diversity of fats that you, you really want to get. I would recommend maybe an avocado or half an avocado along with some macadamia nuts, along with another piece of maybe chicken or something, uh, possibly some lean beef. Try to round it out. Try to get a bunch of different fatty acid profiles. Um, uh, Rahul says, love your videos, Thomas. I need guidance on high intensity interval training at home. I hate going to the gym. Most of the YouTube videos on HIT feel like this. I am 99 kilograms lost. From yeah, you know what? Keep it simple, Rahul. Um, I, let me give a quick instruction on, on HIT really fast because I know people have seen that video of mine that really went major viral uh, talking about what HIT is and what HIT is not. HIT is all about capitalizing on the period of time during the workout, not during the rest periods. So one minute on, one minute off, one minute on, that is, that is low intensity. It may feel like high intensity, but that's not activating the central nervous system. And that's not the way that we want with true high intensity. True high intensity should be like eight to 15 seconds, 100% all out, leave it all on the floor. Okay. Cause that's the real way to do hit. And then if it takes you three minutes to recover, who cares? Okay, because your goal is to tax the central nervous system and your goal is to absolutely just obliterate your creatine phosphate stores and really hit that anaerobic window. Uh, so point with that is you can do anything that you can really push high intensity on. The hard part is when you start going that high intensity, if you're doing any kind of like treadmill work or running or anything like that, that can be very impacting. So usually a bike works phenomenally well. Um, what I wouldn't consider saving up some money and investing in is one of those uh, fan bikes, like those echo bikes or those airdyne bikes. You can find them brand new for like 400 bucks, or you can find them used usually when we're not in these weird times uh, for much less than that. But it's a wise investment if you're worried about strain on the knees. And I, it's probably one of the better pieces of equipment. Um, okay, we've got other questions, of course, coming in. I know you are against MIO and diet soda, Mio during a fast. Um, if you have it during your eating window. Yeah, I'm okay with it during an eating window. I'm, I don't, I'm not like totally opposed to it. I just feel like it breaks a fast, so it's not the best thing. He's talking about flavored water enhancers. Uh, Tom, what are your thoughts on checking blood sugar levels to see if you're still in ketosis? Blood sugar is not the best way to check if you're in ketosis. Um, and the reason is because blood sugar levels can change constantly, okay? If you wanna check to see if you're in ketosis, by all means, check your blood ketones, but blood glucose is not necessarily the best way. And the reason is, is because there's a lot of things that can drive up your blood sugar that aren't necessarily affecting your ketones, right? So for instance, exercise is going to elevate your blood glucose. Sitting in a sauna is gonna elevate your blood glucose, okay? Doesn't mean that you're kicked out of ketosis. It just means that you have a simultaneous increase in um, you know, ketosis or ketogenic or keto, you know, ketogenesis and blood glucose being elevated. Doesn't mean anything. So don't get hung up on that, but there is something that you could do by measuring both. It's called your glucose ketone index and you measure your glucose and your ketones and you divide them by each other. So if my glucose was 100 and my ketones were you know, 10, I'd divide it, you know, 100 by 10. And that's how you come up with your GKI. And there's a lot of calculators on the internet that can help you out with that. 
Uh, guys, can you make sure you hit that thumbs up button, please? It would really help this video out. Um, is lemon water okay on a fast? Uh, Amber, that's a great question. I vote yes. There are some people that would absolutely love to throttle me for saying that. It depends on who you ask. It depends on the situation, depends on the type of fast. Most of the people that are here are fasting for just recreational fasting. They're fasting a few times per week. And I think that lemon water is perfectly fine. I think the benefit you get from lemon water far exceeds the potential couple of calories that are in it. Um, I'm going to make a, you know, another quick point just to stop here really quick and say uh, again, down below in the description right now uh, is keto week over at Thrive. So just FYI, anyone that's watching this, there's 25% off pretty much all the keto items at Thrive Market. So if you use the link down below in the description and you navigate to the search by diet tab, you can search their entire range of food products that are ketogenic. Um, a lot of them I have helped approve and talked about many videos. Anyway, so highly recommend you check them out this week because there's some pretty awesome sales going on. Again, they support the heck out of this channel. So please do check them out in the description. Um, let's see if we've got so many questions coming in. Uh, how many avocados are safe per day? Um, I wouldn't exceed two avocados per day. There's no real reason to. That's a lot of monounsaturated fats. And it's also a lot of fiber and a lot of eventually uh, stuff that could kick you out of keto. Is ACV okay during a fast? That's a great question. Apple cider vinegar. Yes, apple cider vinegar is good to go during a fast. In fact, I did a specific video on it. It hasn't released yet because so many people have asked. Apple cider vinegar is unique because uh, what is in it, which is acetic acid, has an interesting conversion process when it enters a cell. When it enters a cell, it actually puts you deeper into a fasted state because the amount of energy it takes to break down acetate into acetylcoenzyme A actually nets you an ATP loss. And what that means is it costs more energy to metabolize ACV than it does to actually what is actually in it. It puts you in a fasted state deeper. Uh, Heather's new lung says, how is keto different for thus, those of us over 50? I have chronic fatigue. Uh, it's not that easy for me to complete workouts without ending up in bed for two days. Uh, Heather, yeah, you don't need to be, you know, beating yourself up with workouts. Um, one of the most important things, again, for anyone over the age of 50 that's doing keto or fasting is making sure you're keeping an eye on how much protein you get in. There's too much nonsense out there that says that older people should not take in as much protein because it's hard on their kidneys. I, there's no evidence that I've seen that tells me that older people should not be consuming more protein unless they have a pre-existing condition. Protein is going to be what allows you to keep your resting metabolic rate elevated, and I think it's absolutely imperative. Um, as far as the workouts go, uh, you may want to take a look at something called BFR training, blood flow restriction training. Uh, do a little search for it. BFR is really good for people with like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue where they really only need to be able to get in the gym for like 10, 15 minutes because otherwise it causes some issues. That might be a really good solution for you. I saw another um, super chat popped up. Uh, SP says, thank you so much for all the info and research down 70 pounds. Oh, thank you so much for the super chat. Appreciate that. Okay. Lots of questions. How much ACV can I take daily? I wouldn't recommend taking more than like four to six tablespoons per day spread evenly throughout the day. Let's see. Uh, tips on inducing cortisol when already adapted to fasting. Uh, well, you don't necessarily want to induce more cortisol. You kind of want your body's natural response to cortisol to be what it is. Um, during a fast, your cortisol levels elevate. It's perfectly normal. It's what they should do. Cortisol is what's going to allow you to burn fat. So inducing cortisol, I think what you probably mean, if I, if I can kind of extrapolate out of this, you're probably wondering like, how can you induce more kind of stress to get more out of your fast, positive forms of stress? Um, my good friend, uh, Mike Mutzel, um, you've probably seen his, he's got a channel called High Intensity Health. I've done some collaborations with him. If you know Mike, make sure you comment it. He's an awesome guy. Anyhow, um, or make sure you at least check out his channel, High Intensity Health. He did a recent video. Uh, he found some research that shows that doing cold therapy, doing uh, like sitting in a nice bath or taking a cold shower at the beginning of a fast can actually kickstart the fat burning process a lot faster. And it does that via cortisol, of course, but it does that via just the sympathetic nervous system. So very interesting stuff there. Let's see. Man, so many good questions. Hey, can you guys make sure you hit that like button, please? It does help me out while I'm searching for these. Um, let's see. I've lost 120 pounds trying to reduce body fat without losing more weight. Okay, good question, Jackson. I've lost 120 pounds already, which is awesome. I'm trying to reduce body fat without losing more weight. Any suggestions diet-wise? Yes. 
I did an experiment back in February, which ended up yielding me some pretty cool results. What that was, was I kept my calories the same, totally eucaloric. But what I did is I dropped my fat intake three, two to three days per week. And I made up for that fat cap, those fat calories with protein. So what I did was, you know, for example, um, there's nine calories per gram of fat, there's four calories per gram of protein. So I had to reduce fat for every one gram of fat that I reduced, I had to increase protein by about two grams. Okay. So if I dropped 10 grams of fat out of my diet, I had to increase protein 20 grams. So what I did is I dropped like 70 grams of fat and increased my protein, like 140 grams, huge amounts of protein, but I only did this twice a week. So what I, my goal was, was to keep my calories the same, but change my macronutrient ratio on keto. I had the most amazing results. I dropped over 3% body fat in, uh, well, I continued it on, but I dropped like a percent and a half to 2% in a few weeks. And then I continued it on for a couple more weeks and lost a total of 3% body fat. And I was already pretty lean. Um, and nothing changed. You know, my weight stayed the same. So really, really interesting tip there for you guys to experiment with. I kind of dubbed it my fat surging technique after that because it works so well. Okay, another question. Hi there. Quick overview on benefits of organic cacao powder. Mainly it's antioxidant thing. Okay, but I like it for the vasodilation effect and the theobromine. Okay, the vasodilation for me is a big piece. Uh, it's not a short-lived thing. What I mean by that is vasodilation is where you have an increase in blood flow, increase in nitric oxide, Okay, nitric oxide is going to allow you, allows your blood vessels to relax and therefore allows for more nutrient delivery, allows for, uh, you know, a better pump, a better workout. That's really like why I use cacao. Do you count calories on keto? Lisa, uh, tremendous question. And if I answer this wrong, I get destroyed by people on the internet, but calories always matter. Okay. To what degree they matter is questionable. So yes, calories matter. You can't, you know, just go eat 5,000 calories of keto, uh, you know, keto foods and not gain weight. You absolutely can. But the real question that you have to ask yourself is, you know, what's your, how much are you burning or expending at a specific point in time, right? It all is going to vary. We don't know exactly what you're burning at a specific point in time. So we don't know how many calories you need. There is one thing that's for sure. There's a lot of uh, evidence that shows that suppressing insulin levels can play a very big role in allowing your body to utilize fat as a fuel source a lot more. So when you are in a deficit, you're burning the right thing. That's what I like to look at. Not all deficits are created equal. A calorie is a calorie, but not all deficits are the same as, a, as another deficit. I hope that that makes sense. Um, should I break a fast if I'm getting a headache? Kent, a good question. It all depends on how long you've been fasting. Okay, if it's a new fat or if you're new to fasting and you're getting a headache, except that it might be a pretty normal situation. If you've been fasting for a long time and suddenly this comes out of nowhere, um, yeah, you might want to stop because maybe it's something underlying. One of the things that I, I, I put out in a really good video that actually did really well, but then YouTube uh, didn't like it because it was even related. I, basically, just so that you guys know, we can't even put out content that even talks about the immune system right now because it gets taken away. It just gets taken down. It doesn't matter what immune system stuff you're talking about. That's just shadow banning at its finest. Like immune system content, flag removed. Anyhow, I did a great video that talked about how fasting actually suppresses the immune system. And if you're worried about getting sick, you shouldn't be fasting as much. Um, so what ends up happening kind of, you know, to your point where you had asked, um, you know, you were kind of talking about, you know, fasting, getting headaches, if you feel like you're getting sick, then yeah, that could be an issue where maybe you actually are getting sick or you're starting to get a headache because you're getting sick and then you shouldn't be fasting until you feel like you're hundred percent in it. I don't think that fasting is something you should do in a weakened state. This isn't a test of who's strongest and who's the, the best, right? Or who's the most resilient with this. Fasting is supposed to be making us healthier. Don't stress yourself out to the point of getting sicker. Uh, Mickey FC says, which vitamins, herbs, and spices, minerals would you recommend taking during a fast, if any, in which to consume during the eating window? Uh, Mickey, great question. Came at a good time because I, I just actually released a video on vitamins and supplements not to take a fast. And then I did release a video a few weeks ago, I don't know, maybe a month and a half ago, that talked about ones to take during. Um, I would recommend taking theanine during a fast. Works really well during a fast. I would recommend taking magnesium during your fast. I'd recommend uh, sodium, potassium, like salt, a little bit of potassium is good. Uh, creatine is perfectly okay to take during a fast, but it's not going to get you any immediate effect. Uh, caffeine, obviously gonna be okay to take a fast uh, during a fast. Beta alanine, 
citrulline malate for like kind of pre-workout stuff. And the rest take during your eating window. Okay. Anything that's a soft gel, anything that's going to have like, you know, this the oil inside of it, that's going to break a fast. Okay. So we don't want to be having that. Another question um, was wondering if on keto, I should be counting total or net carbs as in some say that fiber, et cetera, can still knock you out of it. So some of the keto community doesn't like when I talk about this because again, it's nebulous territory. Should you count net carbs or total carbs? I'm a believer that you should count half of the fiber carbs. Okay. My light just went out there. So half of the fiber carbs. And what I mean by that is if you have 10 grams of fiber, then I would recommend that you count, or sorry, if you have 10 grams of fiber, I would recommend that you count five of those carbs. Okay. So you're counting essentially half of it. That way you're playing it safe because we don't really know the solid answer to this. Oops, hang on. Thought I lost you guys there for a second. We don't know the solid answer to it. And that way it plays a little bit safe. Okay. One of the things that I get concerned with is, you know, soluble fiber versus regular fiber is different. Soluble fiber, you can get by with a lot uh, less and get the job done. Whereas regular fiber, insoluble fiber, you have to consume a bunch of to really get there. So I would recommend trying to get your fiber from soluble fiber as much as you can. It just would make things a little bit easier. Um, Jamie Sanchez says, do you recommend keto for someone that's beaten cancer, but is still at risk? Uh, what about keto for kids? Those are two things that are very difficult to answer because keto for cancer can vary depending on the type of cancer. It really can. Some cancers, most cancers don't do well uh, without carbohydrates, but some of them actually do. So it all depends. I think from a maintenance side of things, um, you know, again, I'm not a doctor, I'm just a dude on the internet, but it, you know, I've seen people, I mean, my, know some relatives personally that are in remission and love eating a ketogenic diet. Uh, for kids, I think that you should probably allow them the ability to develop glucose tolerance first and then implement ketosis when they're ready, perhaps after adolescence. Uh, Claudio says, thanks for always helping us, Thomas. Lost 35 pounds through keto fasting challenge and subscribe to Thrive Market feeling great. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Claudio. Appreciate the really kind words there. Um, hey, hey, Thomas, I just finished a five-day water fast. Uh, five-day water fast this morning. I want to transition into a strict elimination carnivore diet and then go into keto. How long should I do carnivore before I go on keto? Uh, I would say about four weeks. I think the benefits of carnivore come in at about four weeks. Uh, remember, when you go strict elimination with carnivore, do not use any extra herbs, do not use any extra spices. You should just be salt and pepper, okay? Someone even say pepper you shouldn't use. So really just use salt, maybe a little bit of black pepper. Cook everything bland because you're gonna go pure elimination. And then what you do is when you go keto, you're gonna want to slowly introduce foods. What I would recommend is start with eggs after that. So with your carnivore, I wouldn't even eat eggs for these four weeks. I wouldn't eat dairy either. I would do straight up meat if you're going to do it that clean. That is really strict carnivore. Then the next thing that you'd want to implement is you'd want to implement eggs. That would be the first thing you implement after that. Then I'd be okay with you implementing a little bit of dairy because you're still kind of staying in that annual animal continuum. And then after that, slowly start increasing some of the other nuts and things like that. So I would recommend like macadamia nuts and things like that first nuts that don't have skins and then improve and increase onto nuts that have skins like almonds and cashews and things like that. Well, cashews don't have skins, but they have high phytates. Uh, can you fast when you're healing a broken bone? Good question. I think 16, eight fasting is fine. As long as you get your calories in during that eating period, uh, period. do you recommend 16, eight fasting every day? Connor, I usually don't. If you are going to do 16, eight fasting every day, there's a couple of rules that you really need to follow. Number one is making sure that you get all your calories in during that period. Okay. Number two is making sure that you eat enough protein. And what I mean by that is you should eat just as much protein during your eating window as you would be eating on a whole day. Okay. So if you're only eating in a four hour window, I still want you consuming as much protein as if you were eating all day. I don't want you to be in a protein deficit. Okay. Especially if you're healing from injuries and things like that. Hey, can everyone please hit that thumbs up button as well, please? We've got like 900 people on this broadcast. So if you hit the little like button, thumbs up, it does help this channel out a lot. Um, we've got oh, Babbletop, which is a, a channel that I love is on here. That's awesome. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, my camera shakes. It's not my camera. What it is, I'm leaning on my stand-up desk. So that's what it is. I'm sorry about that, guys. Um, so whenever I'm like putting my hand down to like scroll and look at the comments and stuff like that, then it's making it tough. Um, when to consume MCT powder with IF. Okay. MCT oil is a very good thing 
but it's also something that's overused a lot. Um, I feel like MCT oil is great, but it's also one of those things where people think that because it creates ketones that they should consume a lot of it. It's an ergogenic aid. It's sort of a nootropic. It shouldn't be part of your daily staple unless you want it to be and treat it as a supplement. So don't really treat it as a food. And there's also a lot of foods that have MCT oil in it naturally. So things like, um, of course, coconut oil, things like palm oil, things like goat cheese. Okay, some of the foods that people don't realize, like other cheeses, other dairy products, A2 milk. Like if you were to go uh, get like an A2 half and half, very high in MCT oil naturally. Like goat cheese is like 30% MCT. So you're looking at a good C10 MCT. Now, when would you want to take it? I would recommend taking MCT oil, uh, of course, if you're fasting after you break your fast. So not with your fast breaking meal, but probably with the next meal after that. Um, or if you're working out in your eating window, you could have a little bit pre-workout. But again, it, you have to ask yourself the question, like what are you trying to achieve? Because most of the benefit with MCT is going to be mental. Um, I fast a couple times per week. When should I have a cheat day? Uh, tough to say, but I have a couple of rules for cheat meals. And one of the biggest ones is you should never ever plan your cheat meals unless it's like a specific date night kind of thing. You should just have a cheat meal when you feel like having a cheat meal so that you don't develop an emotional attachment to the cheat meal. Um, let's see, can I sprout bread? Um, can I get lean while still using antidepressants, Paxil and uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors? Uh, it's a good question. It's been coming up a lot in this broadcast. Can you still get lean? Yes, absolutely. It does have an effect on you know certain receptors within the body that can have a role there. So can it be a little bit harder? Yes. It depends on how you feel with caffeine and stuff like that. Caffeine can at least help mobilize the fat, maybe get you over that hurdle a little bit. Uh, Honey York says, I have allergies to avocado nuts, uh, coconut fish, shellfish, and more, including squash. Alternatives, please, sorry for caps. Um, okay, so the alternatives, I would say, well, it depends on what kind of nuts you can do. So you've got uh, most, if most nuts, even people that have nut allergies don't always have issues with uh, macadamia nuts. So macadamia nuts not, might, might not be a bad way, but since you have issues with coconut, you're definitely putting yourself uh, in a tough spot. I would try getting your fats from like palm oil if palm oil doesn't bother you. Uh, very similar fatty acid profile to coconut oil. In fact, it's almost the exact same uh, profile as far as MCTs are concerned. It's still between 45 and 50% lauric acid, which is C12, uh, 12 carbon chain you know, fat, which is tremendous. So I definitely recommend eating from there. Uh, I would go for very good quality, lean, grass-fed, grass-finished beef to try to get more omega-3s. I would also try to use algal oil as your main omega-3 supplement source. Uh, most of your fats are definitely going to come from things like palm oil, things from fattier cuts of meat in this particular case, if you needed to get the fats that way. Uh, ghee, lard, things like that are all going to be okay for you. Let's see. Man, so many good questions. Um, Honey said all nuts. Yeah, so it, it's tough because I know I know she said all nuts, but sometimes people um, have issues with all nuts, but they don't have an issue with macadamia for whatever reason. Okay, so many good questions. Wow. Can you break a fast with chomps? Um, yes, you could. That would be an okay one. They're pretty lean. Yes, there's a couple grams of fat, which is not perfect, but if you're on the go, it's a great way to break your fast. Um, can you fast when you're healing a broken bone? <clears throat> Tom, I think I answered that question already. You can, but I would just do shorter fast to make sure you get your calories in. Jose Benitez says, do you have kids? Yes, I do. I have a five month old, beautiful baby girl, and I have a almost three year old, uh, crazy little boy. So it is crazy in my house. And I will tell you intermittent fasting makes having kids easy because I don't have to snack on convenience foods all the time. <laughs> is collagen safe every day for men? Uh, yes, it definitely is. Yes. Uh, hang on. Sorry. So many questions. Love the new picture. Uh, it's going so fast. Where's my motivation? I don't know if that's sarcasm or uh, like if that's a real question, like what motivates me? Uh, if I can be completely honest, it's difficult sometimes because a lot of my motivation is intrinsic. You know, I, I just like doing what I do. I like doing things that challenge me. Uh, I like to experiment and I like to share my experiments with people, but sometimes the internet makes it a tough place to do that because you experiment, you just get destroyed, right? So it's, it's tough because it's made it so that I don't want to share experiments as much. And that's where a lot of my motivation lies. So most of my motivation now is experimenting on myself to be able to create content. Um, that's, it's a lot of fun for me, but also my family. That's like the biggest piece here. I want to be healthy. I want to figure out how to live for the longest amount of time so that I can be there for my family, but also for my own selfish reasons, because I want to see my family grow. And that's just the way I'm going to be. You know, I want to live to be 
old and brittle so that I can see my kids grow old. Um, let's see. How do you maintain your weight after you achieve your goal with whole day fasting? Yeah, so with whole day fasting, you're going to achieve your weight goal relatively quick. So what do you do? Well, what I would recommend generally is rolling from fasting protocols into a ketogenic lifestyle actually works very, very well because you're leveraging a lot of the same benefits. So you're leveraging some of the benefits of fasting, which is ketone production, fatty acid oxidation, accelerated lipolysis, um, the right kind of mitochondrial machinery. So then when you roll into ketosis, it allows you to kind of maintain the benefits of fasting that much more. And it also makes it so that next time you do fast, it's going to be a lot easier. So um, any thoughts on weight loss during, uh, with the drug Fentermine with keto? Um, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. So Fentermine, I, I, I mean, I'm not a doctor, so I have to answer it kind of loosely, but that's a, uh, you know, medically supervised, medically prescribed weight loss drug, uh, keto with Fentermine, it ultimately still works upon the same sort of epinephrine kind of catecholamine pathway in a lot of ways. So it's just a significant stimulant. So if you think about the benefits of coffee and how that mobilizes fat, Yes, it's going to be in the same situation with Fentermine, although it's probably accelerated. So although I'm not a doctor, again, once again, some guy on the internet, it is going to probably be effective with keto. Uh, how does the ketogenic diet increase libido? The ketogenic diet doesn't necessarily directly increase libido. You see, what it does is it provides you with the sterols and the cholesterols that you need to produce testosterone and produce the things that give you libido what we find is that a lot of people are deficient in those steroid hormones in their body and they, or they're deficient in the cholesterol that supports them. Ketogenic diet gives us the ability to produce those. Um, Andy says, so is it okay to combine ACV and green tea with a bit of Lakanto for a morning drink during my fast? Glad that you said that. If you use the Lakanto liquid uh, sweetener, yes. Do not, use, I, full disclaimer, I like Lakanto and on keto, it's great. But Lakanto combines their monk fruit with erythritol in their powder form. Erythritol is perfectly safe, perfectly fine. I like the stuff. I do not dislike it, but it is a sugar. Technically, how it works in the body is a sugar alcohol to some degree, absorbs through passive diffusion, which means it has a degree of digestion. Not going to be the best thing on a fast. So I would try to get liquid monk fruit or liquid stevia. Lakanto has a liquid monk fruit. It's not the cheapest, but it'll last you a long time. So I would recommend that, Andy. I hope that helps. Um, Collodial gold helps with libido. Any tips with helping someone go through menopause? You know, I actually did a specific video on this. Uh, and menopause, it gets a little bit different. But again, it kind of comes down to, once again, probably not fasting as much as you normally do. Probably back it off just a little bit until your body adjusts. Uh, because it would be the bad time to try to establish a new metabolic baseline. So like right when you fast, you know, your metabolism is going to slow down a little bit. And then you're doing that in menopause, your body's going to be like, oh, this is the new normal. And then all of a sudden, you know, it, so I would try to bring down the fasting for like two days per week. Um, Andy Park, uh, you're very welcome. Glad I was able to answer that for you. One of the questions that people ask a lot, a lot of women ask this question. Um, and what, sorry, my getting this text message is blowing me up. Note to self, put yourself on do not disturb. Okay. <laughs> Very distracting. So because they have that women's intermittent fasting challenge going on right now, there is a, a lot of questions that come up about this. Okay. So through the 28 day menstrual cycle, you're going to have a period of estrogen and a period of progesterone. The first two weeks of your cycle are going to be heavily estrogen oriented. And the back half is going to be more progesterone. Estrogen, although it gets a bad rap, is actually very, very muscle sparing. So ladies, you're going to be able to get away with longer fasts during your estrogen phase. So right after your cycle, right after your menstrual uh, period, okay, then that'll be a two week period where you should experiment with longer fasts and you're going to have more success. Also, if you're starting a ketogenic diet and you are female and you've never done it before, you are best off starting right after your cycle, okay? The first two weeks of your cycle, right after your period, I should say. And then what that's gonna do is it's going to give you a buffer. It's going to give you that estrogen that's going to allow you to get into ketosis a little bit easier because you're less hungry, okay? And it's also more fatty acid friendly, okay? Then progesterone is the second phase. And that's usually when you get really hungry. And that's usually when you have more difficulty. That's a perfect time to do shorter fasts, okay? So estrogen phase, first part, longer fasts, start out keto. Second phase, 
hold off on starting keto and do shorter fasts. Okay, I hope that that helps. Um, his arms are not ele- his arms are not eleven inches. Someone say my arm. If my arms were eleven inches, I think my wrists are like eleven inches. Uh, Mars V says my LDL shot up to one ninety seven since starting keto three months ago, but my uh, triglycerides HDL ratio is one point two. Any suggestions? Um, it's not uncommon for LDL to go up. Again, one of the things you may want to first consider doing is try reducing saturated fat content a little bit because we have LDL receptors in our uh, liver. And what happens is when we consume a bunch of saturated fat, those LDL receptors take up the saturated fat. Well, that ends up where they take up the, basically it creates a surplus of LDL for a while. And then long story short, they go to the liver and because you're consuming so much, it ends up blocking the reuptake. So you have an increase in LDL levels. Whether contrary to what a lot of keto people say, I don't want to see your LDL levels elevated because if LDL is elevated, it has the ability to become oxidized. LDL is not bad in the bloodstream unless it's oxidized. That's very important. LDL is not bad unless it's oxidized. But if you are consistently having high LDL levels, they're staying high, then you don't want that LDL floating in the bloodstream because it can react with oxygen and become oxidized. That's when you pose a problem. So one thing that you have to be certain of is when you are getting these blood tests done, are you 100% fasted for at least like 14 hours? If you're on keto, you should be fasted for 14 hours when you're getting your blood lipids tested because your blood levels are going to be different on keto. Um, Test it a couple times in a given week or two week period. Okay, I highly recommend it because it's going to change dramatically and you might have one reading that's high and one reading that's not. So there is a a company, I can put it in the chat box called walkinlab.com where you can just get a lab test done, where you can order your lab test and walk into a lab core or a quest without having to go to the doctor. So if it's, it's literally cheaper sometimes to get a lipid panel for like 30 or 40 bucks through them than it is to pay your copay, meet your deductible, blah, 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 blah. Um, And if you're in the States, you know, our whole insurance system is just a friggin' scam. Uh, Austin Smith says, um, when on keto, my gym performance goes up, but long distance and cardio and VO2 max goes down. Any advice? That's wild, Austin. That's a little bit backwards, to be completely honest. You're probably aware of that. Usually people see their gym performance go down. That's a great sign, though, because what that means is that your body is ruthlessly efficient at gluconeogenesis, and it's creating enough glucose to give you that anaerobic energy. Um, Have you tried doing your long-distance cardio um, in a deeper fasted state? to see if you can put yourself there. If if you have, uh, and you haven't experienced an improvement, then there's a good chance that you actually may wanna consider having some fats prior to your your runs, your your cardio, which is not something I would normally recommend. But if you're having this sort of backwards response, having a little bit of coconut oil before going on a run or doing long distance might not be a bad idea. Uh, Can eating too much chicken breast kick you out of ketosis? I mean, if you ate like 10 breasts, yes. But the old school stuff, and I ate my own words on this, guys. I mean, like three years ago, I put out content that was saying, be careful of too much protein. It'll kick you out of keto. I left those videos up. I probably could have deleted them, but I feel like it's good for authenticity's sake to show sort of the evolution. Um, You know, science has come out and and demonstrated. Science doesn't change, by the way. Just so you know, like science doesn't change. The science remains the same. Our perception, our discovery of it changes. So we've learned now that Protein doesn't kick you out of ketosis. Protein does contribute to gluconeogenesis, but gluconeogenesis doesn't mean that you're kicked out of ketosis. Just like someone asked earlier, you can have high levels of blood glucose, but still have decent ketone levels. So chicken, no, not gonna kick you out of keto. I'm gonna answer two more questions, everyone, and then I've gotta hop off. And please do, guys, remember uh, Keto Week over at Thrive. It's the biggest keto sale they've ever done. So if you use the link down below to check out Thrive Market, You can get all like the keto pantry staples, things that I talk about, um, heavily, heavily discounted, like 25% off over 250 different items. So big week over at keto. There's a link or over at thrive link down below in the description. If you don't, can't click it thrivemarket.com slash Thomas. Okay. Thrivemarket.com slash Thomas. Uh, also we're going to answer two questions and I've got some big news, big news that I want to share. So don't leave. Um, okay. Can I have eggs to break a prolonged fast? Not the best option because eggs can be inflammatory for some, uh, but I would recommend if you were going to do eggs, go the opposite of what I'd normally suggest. In this case, do egg whites. I don't want saturated fats right when we break a fast because there's some evidence that shows that right when you break a fast, 
saturated fats can trigger the release or the leaking of lipopolysaccharides into the bloodstream from the gut. So egg whites would be okay, but ideally go for like a lean chicken, lean turkey, something that's going to be a little bit higher in uh, thiamine. Uh, how many inches are my arms? That's not an actual question I'm gonna use, but they're, they're about 18 inches. Um, I, I only measure them like four times a day though. So is veggie keto a thing? And if so, do you have any tips? Tremendous question and asked all the time. Vegetarian keto absolutely is a thing. Uh, I did a vegan keto challenge about a year and a half ago and had really good success with it. I lost some muscle though. And it took me about a month to put it back. Um, so it's absolutely doable. That's the nice thing is keto is doable with your vegan, vegetarian, whatever. Okay. It's, it's absolutely doable. You don't have to um, eat a bunch of meat. You don't have to eat a bunch of cheese. Okay. It's all ketosis is the nutritional state that you're in, not about necessarily what you're eating. So, hey guys, just so you know, I am going to be starting a, uh, a new channel, just so you know. Uh, it's going to be much more geared towards workouts. It's going to be much more geared towards uh, garage workouts, and it's going to be geared a lot towards parents. Um, it's going to be a lot of gearing towards dads. Doesn't mean that it's not going to be good content for moms, but I really want it to. I feel like part of my um, mission here on earth is to help people be healthy. And one of the ways that I can exponentially do that is help people be healthy, but also help their families be healthy. And uh, that means empowering parents to be the best versions of themselves. This isn't going to be like cheesy, weird, kind of like voodoo magic, witch doctor stuff. It's going to be, you know, realistic stuff that I think people can relate to. Because I think one of the things that I've seen that I think I'm good at and resonate with people is how to empower people to become healthier and teach them to empower people. So there's gonna be good content for dads, good workout content. I know I've saturated the heck out of this channel. I'm not blind. I put a lot of content on it and it makes it hard for people to see the content. Um, so I figured if I create a new channel where I kind of limit myself to maybe two videos per week and focus it much more on the exercise side, I think you guys are really gonna like it. So one of the things, the favors that I'm gonna need from you guys is to continually check back to the channel because I know that you don't see all the videos I post. I know that not everything makes it up there. I know that not everyone sees it. So it's very important you guys continually check back. And what I'm gonna do is pretty soon, probably in the next month or so, I'm gonna release a sign up form to be like the first subscribers on my channel and on this new channel. And then when we launch, it's probably gonna launch December, but it might launch the first of the year because I wanna be able to have it seeded with a bunch of good content already. So it's very important, please keep checking back, okay? I don't want you to miss it. And then once it goes live, you can imagine that I'll be pushing it a lot to try to get the right people over there, um, people that are more focused on uh, using this channel that I'm currently on for nutrition and the other channel much more for workout, much more for, for lifestyle and for fun. So I think we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have some fun. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be nice to have a little bit of a different spin. So once again, you all are wonderful. Appreciate you guys, love you guys. Thanks for motivating me to keep doing what I do. And don't forget to check out uh, Thrive Market and that keto sale down below. And also don't forget to check out the meal plan and everything down below as well. All right, see you guys soon.